In this video, we'll be discussing atypical antipsychotics. So the atypical antipsychotics are primarily used for two specific indications. The first is schizophrenia, and schizophrenia is primarily characterized by positive and negative symptoms. So the positive symptoms are hallucinations, delusions, things like that, and the negative symptoms are more social withdrawal, apathy, or a lack of uh, caring, if you will. Bipolar disorder is completely different than schizophrenia, and it's primarily described as the balance between mania and depression. So mania is impulsive behavior and delusions, whereas the depression side is more sadness, hopelessness, and guilt, the typical depression that you think of. Clearly, these are very abbreviated uh, summaries of the, these diseases, but I think it's important to have some concept of what is schizophrenia and what is bipolar disorder, because both of these are frequently used in media like in movies, but are really misrepresented in terms of the types of symptoms that make up the, these two disease states. In addition to these two, some of our atypical antipsychotics can be used both on and off label as an adjunct in, in depression or major depressive disorder. Not all of them, and it's not used all the time, but they can sometimes be used for that purpose. There are five atypical antipsychotics that we'll be talking about in this video. The first is olanzapine, the brand name is Zyprexa, and this is one of the first ones to the market that is still commonly used. Then we have quetiapine or Seroquel, Risperidone or Risperdal. And clearly you can see that there's a good match of the brand and generic there. Ziprazidone or Geodon, and then finally Aripiprazole or Abilify. Again, this one, both uh, the brand and generic start with A, which can be helpful. We're gonna talk about each of these in detail and I think that one good goal in thinking about these atypical antipsychotics is distinguishing and differentiating them because they are different drugs and they do have pretty different adverse effect profiles and pharmacology. So in general, our atypicals work by blocking the dopamine receptor, specifically the D2 receptor, but they also work by blocking the serotonergic 2A receptor, or 5-HT subtype 2A. And by blocking both of these, we think that the interplay between the dopamine and the serotonin blockade makes these atypical. And we'll talk about what is different between atypicals and typicals like haloperidol. Primarily, this informs the adverse effect profile and a little bit of the efficacy as well. So the biggest difference between typical antipsychotics like haloperidol and our atypicals, which are the ones that we're talking about in this video, the biggest difference is that we often don't see extrapyramidal symptoms or EPS symptoms. Those EPS symptoms are things like akathisia or restlessness, acute dystonia, which is a contraction of the muscle, and then finally, pseudoparkinsonism. We often don't see these adverse effects, at least not at the rates that we would with our atypicals compared to our typical antipsychotics like haloperidol. What we do see instead though are some pretty unique adverse effects. One is weight gain, dyslipidemia, and diabetes, and we kind of classify this under an umbrella term of metabolic syndrome. So with certain atypical antipsychotics in particular, we can see more weight gain and risk factors for cardiovascular disease. We do see quite a bit of sedation with some of these agents. And then finally, we can see dizziness and orthostasis, which is feeling lightheaded when standing up too quickly. And these are uh, common with many of our atypical antipsychotics, some more than others, and we'll talk about kind of distinguishing them in just a second here. So one way I think it's important to kind of remember these atypical antipsychotics is to uh, really distinguish each of them individually in terms of what makes them unique. With olanzapine or Zyprexa, the biggest adverse effect with that is the metabolic syndrome, at least compared to the other atypical antipsychotics. So weight gain and diabetes are very concerning and very common with olanzapine or Zyprexa. In terms of quetiapine or Seroquel, the biggest adverse effect with this one is sedation. Really the reason that we get so much sedation is that it has a lot of anticholinergic effects to it. And actually, it's frequently used off-label, and in my opinion, inappropriately, as an off-label sleep aid, kind of a souped up uh, diphenhydramine or Benadryl, when it really shouldn't be used for that purpose. One way that you can remember that it's so sedating is it has the word quiet in the word quetiapine. In examining risperidone or risperidol a little bit more closely, the unique clinical pearl in terms of adverse effect that we'll see with risperidone 
is what's called hyperprolactinemia. Hyperprolactinemia just means an elevated level of prolactin in the blood. And typically, this only manifests as gynecomastia or breast tenderness or pain, kind of female breast development in men. Very rarely, but can absolutely happen with that hyperprolactinemia is actually lactation. So galactorrhea or production of milk. Mostly this is going to be in women. So again, the actual adverse effect that we'll see is most commonly gynecomastia, but can result in lactation as well. And very unique to the atypicals, uh, risperidone can cause extrapyramidal symptoms or EPS. And this was our akathisia, dystonia, and pseudoparkinsonism. And this is unique because our atypicals usually don't cause EPS at all. And this is more common with our typicals like haloperidol and other typical antipsychotics. So both the gynecomastia and the EPS symptoms are very unique to risperidone or risperidol. And for that reason, risperidone is kind of the closest atypical that we have to a typical antipsychotic, meaning that risperidone is the closest pharmacologically and in its adverse effect profile to something like haloperidol. Ziprazidone or geodon has a few unique characteristics to it. The first is that unlike some of the other atypicals, we have very little or no weight gain, whereas with something like olanzapine, we saw a lot of weight gain with that. Ziprazidone or geodon should be taken with food. It actually doubles the absorption when it's taken with food. And then finally, there is some warning regarding mild QT prolongation. And as a review, QT stands for one segment of the EKG strip. Uh, so this is your P wave, QRS, and T wave. So QT stands for the beginning of the QRS complex and the end of the T wave. And there is some concern that uh, if this expands too much, that you can be at risk for arrhythmias, specifically an arrhythmia called torsades. There are no case reports of torsades with ziprazidone, but we do know that it can increase the QT by about 10 milliseconds, which is almost clinically insignificant, but it has made its way into the packaging for the product. Finally, our last atypical antipsychotic is aripiprazole or Abilify. And this one's actually kind of unique because unlike the other atypicals, it's a partial D2 agonist, whereas the other atypicals were a D2 antagonist. What that means is that if a patient has too much dopamine, this partial agonist will sit on the dopamine receptor and make it so the dopamine can't stimulate the dopamine receptor as much. In contrast, if the patient has too little dopamine, it is a dopamine agonist, so it will increase dopamine activity. Uh, the manufacturer likes to call this a dopamine system stabilizer, where it tries to stabilize out the amount of dopamine activity in the brain based on if you have too little or too much, and it brings you back to what uh, the drug would consider a normal level. Kind of like our zeprazidone, we see very little weight gain, very little sedation, very little orthostasis. So this is very different than something like olanzapine. What is unique about it though is that we get akathisia, again that's inner restlessness, kind of inability to sit still, and then also insomnia. So aripiprazole compared to something like quetiapine is very activating, whereas with quetiapine it was very sedating. So even though these drugs are approved for similar indications and they're all under the atypical antipsychotic umbrella, they behave very differently in terms of how they produce adverse effects in the body. All atypicals have a boxed warning for dementia, specifically in the elderly. So it's not uncommon that elderly patients, especially if they have dementia, will be given an atypical antipsychotic to make them have less agitation. The problem though is that in the clinical studies, if an elderly person does get an atypical, their risk of mortality over 10 weeks goes up by about 1.6 to 1.7 times. So in the trial that looked at this, the mortality rate if you got an atypical antipsychotic was 4.5% versus 2.6% over 10 weeks. The interesting thing though is that the cause of death was not one specific thing. So heart failure, sudden cardiac death, pneumonia, we don't really know why it causes death, but we do know that these should be used with great caution in the elderly, specifically those who have dementia. So with that said, if possible, we should be avoiding the use of atypicals in the elderly, especially for dementia. And if we have to use it, we should minimize the dose or duration because it does appear that it increases mortality in that patient population.
To summarize, we talked about five atypical antipsychotics, and I really want to emphasize how different each of these are, even though they're all atypical antipsychotics. The first was olanzapine or Zyprexa, and we saw a lot of the metabolic syndrome and weight gain with this medication. Then quetiapine or Seroquel was a very sedating atypical antipsychotic. The next agent was Risperidone or Risperdal. This was the atypical that was closest to a typical antipsychotic because we did see EPS symptoms with it. And kind of the unique adverse effect with it was the hyperprolactinemia that not uncommonly resulted in gynecomastia. Ziprazidone or geodon. This was interesting because we saw very little weight gain and maybe some signal of a QT prolongation, although it probably is clinically not terribly relevant. And then finally, very different than all of the others, aripiprazole or Abilify was a partial dopamine agonist, so kind of a dopamine system stabilizer, and it was more activating than many of the other atypicals. So if anything, it caused insomnia, but it did have some akathisia associated with it.